entitled The Fall and Rise of Joseph, here's what we've seen so far. Because of his jealous brothers, Joseph went from being thrown in a pit to being sold to a caravan on their way to Egypt. He finds himself in a strange land. He ends up in a strange house, the house of Potiphar, an Egyptian soldier, a commander. And we noted that the brothers had become a prisoner of their bitterness, but Joseph had become a prisoner of God. And you know, we all make that choice. When things happen to us, we decide what we'll be a prisoner of. Will I be a prisoner of my bitterness or will I be a prisoner of God? Will I let bitterness have its way with me or will I let God have his way with me? Imagine what Joseph had just gone through, sold into slavery by family, his own brothers, taken hundreds of miles to a strange land. They worshiped foreign gods. It was a foreign culture, foreign language, foreign customs. And he's only a teenager, 17 years old. And yet, what did he do at 17? He's a smart kid. He learned the language of the Egyptians. He improved his skills. He bettered himself all around. See, sometimes people get in a bad situation and they just make it worse because they feel bad for themselves. Joseph bettered himself in a bad situation. And we noted two outcomes of that. Number one, that Joseph, through it all, he stayed faithful to God. And number two, Potiphar, who Joseph was a slave to, observed his character. And Potiphar noticed that Joseph was a man of God. So we pick it up in verse 4 of Genesis 39. Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. He made Joseph the boss of the whole estate. But you know, all didn't remain good for Joseph. Today we're going to see the conflict of temptation versus testimony. Every believer will have that conflict. Temptation will meet you. Temptation will try to beat you. And then you always try to consider your testimony. What will I look like when it's all said and done? Verse 6. He left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there... He did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Potiphar would choose his own meals. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. She looked with desire at Joseph. The word looked is the word in Hebrew, nasa. And it means to lift the eye. And it's interesting, the word desire, it's the same word. Nasa. What does it mean to lift the eye? When you lift the eye, you're taking an intentional glance. You're looking like on purpose. TV commercials are intended to lift your eye, to get you to take a second look at what they're selling. Sometimes car commercials, have you noticed lately, they barely show the car? You don't know anything much about the car, but they might show, if you get this car, you'll be macho. Buy this Lincoln, and you'll be macho like Matthew McConaughey. You'll look like him. Just buy this car. And the focus is on looking like him rather than, how good is the car? Uh, there's another car commercial and it's all about, it's not about the car, it's about family. And I'm sure it's a good car. The Subaru commercials. Matter of fact, I love the Subaru commercials. But you rarely see the car. It's all about the family. It's safety for the family. So what it, it makes you look at, ooh, my family will be safe if I get this car. So it's a good way to sell a product. Uh, there's another car, the Kia Credenza, which is a car I like, but I can't afford it. 
And it's it's and, and what they say in this commercial, if you buy this car, ladies, you'll be sexy. Yeah. They show this nice lady walking down the street. You see that? And all the guys in limos, they're all opening their doors, thinking she's gonna get in. She's dressed nice, luxurious, and she goes, passes them all, and she gets in her little, which is not really little, Kia Credenza and drives away. You don't know anything about the car. All you know is, you get that car, you're gonna look like her. <laughs> That's the idea. That's the idea. So for $40,000, you can have an extreme makeover. <laughs> the idea is to make you feel like the person driving the car. Doesn't tell you much about the car. Movie trailers. How do they get you to go to the movies? They show the best part. They lift your eyes. It's like, oh, I want to go see that movie. I've seen movie trailers that were so good, then I go to the movie, that movie stunk. <laughs> stunk. But the trailer was great. It got you in. It got you to go to the movies. So they're attention getters. So when, when Potiphar's wife, who we don't know her name, lucky for her, I guess, when Potiphar's wife lifted her eyes at Joseph, she made an extended intentional glance like, hmm, this one's for me. And uh, I think the lesson today is be careful about what lifts your eyes. Be careful about what gets you to take an extended second glance at something. Uh, when it comes to relationships, and I want to say ladies, but men too, but a lot of times ladies, if you have to dress in such a way as to lift the eyes of the other person, you're making a big mistake. You're selling the wrong product. And if you sell the wrong product, you're going to get the wrong buyer. So just be careful. The Apostle Peter said, let your beauty not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry and putting on dresses. He's not saying that's wrong. He's saying don't let it only be that. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. So what are we saying? We're saying let your beauty begin on the inside. That's what's important. Beauty begins on the inside and works its way out. Beauty on the outside where there's no beauty on the inside, eh. But when it's on the inside and works its way out, now you have the whole deal. So Potiphar's wife, she, uh, you know, wasn't like that. She lifted her eyes to Joseph and then it happened. Her thoughts turned into actions. And she said to Joseph, lie with me. Hmm. Now remember Lot's wife? She got in trouble with her eyes too. When the angel came to Lot and said, get your family out of the city, and don't look back. They all left, but Lot's wife had to look back and take that final look. Why? Because she loved the city. She loved the city of Sodom. And when she looked back, she lifted her eyes. She turned into a pillar of salt. She died. And perhaps the pillar of salt just speaks of being a monument to those that lift their eyes to the wrong things. Now verse 8. Joseph refused and said to his master's wife, Oh, behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he's put all that he owns in my charge. There was no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Joseph he understands that he owes a debt to his master, Potiphar. And he owes a debt to God. But you know what? She tempted him day after day after day. Temptations like that, it'll come back day like a stray cat. You give a stray cat milk, it'll come back. Temptation will come back day after day after day. Joseph had a powerful set of convictions. 
that he lived by. And you know what was so good about Joseph? His authority was on the inside, not on the outside. When you have an inside authority, you're safe anywhere you go. But if your authority is on the outside, you're still not safe. Because if you don't see the authority, then you're liable to fall and to fail. So it's a good place to be, to, to live according to the authority that's in you. Like you can drive down the, down the highway 100 miles an hour because you don't see the police car. But when you see the police car, do you ever notice the cars in front of you, all their brake lights come on? Do you ever notice your brake lights go on? But if you're always driving according to what's right, then the authorities on the inside and people go flying by you and you feel safe because you're doing the speed limit and they go by you and you say, oh, I hope they get caught. <laughs> Don't you? Don't you? You guys are something. I hope they get Because I'm driving 65. They're going 95. I hope they get caught. Oh, you guys are funny. Okay. So again, what we, we want to get to the place. This is why we come to church. We learn to get the authority of God on the inside rather than just on the outside. Earlier we, earlier we saw that Joseph stayed faithful to God and his walk with God kept him pure in his thinking. Joseph was divinely systematic in his thinking. I call it having a system to his thinking. And this is why. Number one, Potiphar put everything in Joseph's charge. He promoted him to be in head over the whole estate. Number two, he knew he was the top dog in the house. So he was appreciative of the position that was given him. He wanted to live responsibly because he was blessed with an awesome position and he didn't want to throw it away. He appreciated what Potiphar had done for him. I was watching Undercover Boss the other night with Donna. You guys ever see Undercover Boss? You have a TV? Okay. Undercover Boss, I'll tell you what, will bring a tear to your eye. It really will. If you like to cry, I'm going to like to cry. <laughs> right? It, because there's always a, a sad story and they get blessed at the end. So in this particular scene, th this particular company, an undercover boss, the CEO disguises himself and he becomes a worker in these companies, in his own company, and they don't know he's the boss. So he's driving with one of the truck drivers of his company. The truck driver doesn't know who he is. And the truck driver is bad mouthing the company, mocking the company, arguing with customers. He's a real bad dude, you know? And um, at the end of the show, the CEO usually works with about four different people in different aspects of the company and they all have real sad stories and he blesses them with maybe you know a promotion or a raise or a bonus or a vacation or something he always gets something good and this particular driver he faces a CEO and it's like oh and you know what he got a rebuke he got a rebuke from the boss because why he was mocking the company that hired him, that paid him, that supported him, that gave him a job. And they, they said, listen, we're going to have to retrain you all over again. And you're going to be demoted. And you're going to ride with somebody else until you learn how to conduct yourself. You know, and I think there's a good lesson there. If you have a job, appreciate it. Appreciate the fact that you've got something to do and a company has given you a chance to make a living. And if you don't like the job, then get another one. But don't mock the company. Well, never mock the guy that pays you. Don't mock the company that helps you buy food for your family and pays your rent. Just doesn't make any sense, okay? And, and Joseph, I guess if he was on Undercover Boss, he would have got the big blessing at the end. So Joseph appreciates what he's got, okay? And then thirdly, if Joseph gave in to the temptation of Potiphar's wife, it would not only be a sin against Potiphar, but it's also a sin against himself and a sin against God. 
You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 6.32, the one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. Lacking sense. Like, he's got no brains. Like, why would you do that? He who would destroy himself does it. He says, when people are, on, are in adultery, they are on the road to destruction. Nothing good comes from adultery, only ruin. Just ruin. Nothing else. Joseph understood this. Notice in verse 10, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. He just kept resisting and resisting. One day, Joseph went into the house to carry out his duties, and no one was in the house. He probably figured, this is good. She's gone. <laughs> I'm alone. I can do my work. And then, boom, she came out of nowhere. She grabbed his garment and said, lie with me. And Joseph did the right thing. He flew the coop. <laughs> he ran away. Joseph knew how to handle temptation. He ran from it. He didn't like, well, let me entertain it and just see how far I can go before it turns into sin. He ran, unlike Samson, the strongest man in the world. And yet, he couldn't resist Delilah. Unlike David, the greatest king of Israel, but he couldn't keep his eyes off of Bathsheba. But Joseph, he's a mere slave. That's all he is, a slave in Egypt. And he ran from temptation. He understood, oh, temptation's not my friend. I need to run. See, temptation's like matches. You don't play with them. You don't play with matches. When I was five years old, I found a book of matches. And I played with matches. And I was playing with matches and lighting the matches, and I lit this little, little patch of grass on fire, and it was burning. The problem was, the grass was up against our house, and there was a propane tank there. In those days, we had propane. The whole side of the house went up in flames. And I walked in the house, five years old, I said, Mom, I think the house is on fire. <laughs> And they ran out, ah, call the fire department, <laughs> whole side of the house, all black. The propane plant could have, could have exploded. God was with me even at five. My father could have killed me, he didn't. You know, sometimes you do something that's so bad, you don't get punished for it. You ever notice that? It's so bad that, that it's punishment enough, just what you did. And then I remember the fire chief came over and looked at me and, Play with matches, you know. That was the worst day of my life. But in temptations like that, you have to flee. You can't play around with that. No matter what the temptation is, could be anything. Could be at work. Could be out to play. Could be how you golf is like to kick the ball. Even a little thing like that develops bad habits. You know, anything. So even later on, you know what the apostle Paul said? He said to young Timothy, "Flee youthful." lusts. That when you're young, that there are things that you tend to go after that you shouldn't flee from that. Remember Joseph, 17, 18, 19? He's probably getting a little older now. Maybe he's 20. Been, been around for a few years. He learned the language. And uh, he's still young. And uh, he's like, he still knows. His authority, even though he's in a distant land, his inside authority never changed. Unlike the prodigal son, who was in a distant land, and he squandered everything. When Joseph was in a distant country, he still remained Joseph. How cool is that? To be who you are, no matter where you are. Businessmen, you go on the road, and you stay in hotels because you're traveling. You be who you are, no matter where you are. You be that same faithful person, that same pure person. How many people fail and fall because of traveling? Because it, they change when they're away from where they are, from where conviction is, 
from where the home is. You gotta be who you are no matter where you go. So Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife, but the garment remained in her hand. Hmm. See, Joseph teaches us, run from the things that get in the way of God's plan for your life. God has a plan for everybody. And there are things that are, get, that are gonna get in the way. Those are the things that you run from. Now, Joseph was ruled by principles. Potiphar's wife was ruled by passion. There's a difference. Passion is more emotional. Principles are more intellectual. Joseph understood what a principal man lives like. So what did she do? She called out to the men in the house and said, the Hebrew, he accosted me. And I screamed, and look, here's his garment. Here's his robe. It was like the proof that what she was saying was true. And then Potiphar came home. And the Bible tells us he got really, really angry at Joseph. Now notice verse 19. When his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, this is what your slave did to me. Notice, this is what your slave did to me. Ever notice, ladies, when you get mad at your kids, talk to your husband, do you know what your son did? All of a sudden, he's not your son. He's his son. Well, this is what your slave did to me. And Potiphar's anger burned. Verse 20. So Joseph's master, he took him and put him in jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. So Joseph went to jail. Now remember, all through these events, God is working in the heart of Joseph. God is refining Joseph, just like he's refining us. God knows what he wants us to be like at the end of it all. And he's refining us. And the things that happened this week are to refine you. And the things that happened last month and last year are to refine you. God has a, a picture of what he wants you to be like. And all of these things are part of that refining to get us to that place. So Joseph's master put him in prison. Verse 21, as bad as these events had become, the Lord was with Joseph. It's good to know. The Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Now he's in jail. He's in a dungeon. But notice, God is still being good to Joseph. You can discover the goodness of God even in a place that might not seem that good. A lot of times we focus on the place we're at rather than the God we're with. We think about, I don't like this place I'm in, but wait a minute, what about the God that's with you? Like the three Hebrew boys in the fire. Yeah, they were in a fire, it wasn't good. That furnace was turned up so hot, the guys that threw them in, they burned. And they were on the outside. And they were in this place. And yet, Jesus Christ met them in the fire. He met them. God was with them in the fire. God was with Noah in the flood. As a matter of fact, the only time God wasn't with someone was with his own son. When Jesus hung on that cross and took our sin, the Bible tells us that God turned his back on his own son for three hours and judged him. Judged him for us. But God is always with his people. You gotta remember that. He's always with you. There's never a time he will not be with you. Even if your circumstances don't look that good, God is with you in the circumstances. So the chief jailer, again, Joseph's, see, here's the cool thing. Joseph's character never changed. He didn't, you know, he didn't go to jail and become hardened. He went to jail and stuck with God 
and God continued to emanate through him. And now even the jailer saw God in Joseph. And the chief jailer did for Joseph what Potiphar did. He put him in charge of everything. Now, <laughs> Joseph's in charge of everything in the jail. Whatever that looks like, I don't know. But Joseph is the foreman of the prison. Huh. And as Joseph was in charge of all of Potiphar's Potiphar slaves, now he's in charge of all the prisoners in the jail. You see, God was and still is with him. He's still with him. Sometimes we make the mistake of evaluating the presence of God based on our circumstances, right? Good circumstances, God is here. Bad circumstances, God is gone. Where's God? How many people have said in the midst of a situation that really sunk, where's God? Where's God? Doesn't God see? Doesn't God hear? Where's God? God's right there. He's right there with you. Our circumstances have nothing to do with the presence of God. God is with us all the time. All the time. Whether you're in the house or in the prison, God is with you. And we never want to evaluate God based on how we're feeling or where we are, or what station in life we might be at. God is always there. And when we're in that station that we don't like, it's not comfortable, we don't like it, it's not convenient, well, God is there. And you know what he's doing? Shaping, chiseling, molding. You know, the good times don't fashion us to the image of Christ as much as the difficult times do. The difficult times are the things that make us like Christ, not the good times. The good times are a reprieve, but God does his best work in the storm. And he wants us to be good sailors. And it takes a storm to make a good sailor. And we have to remember that. So Joseph teaches us, evaluating our circumstances is a bad assumption. Evaluating how you feel, where you are, and then the presence of God, that's a bad thing to do because it's not correct. He also teaches us that our testimony will be challenged by temptation. We decide who will win. Another choice we make. It's another one. We decide who we'll be the prisoner of, bitterness or God. We also decide who will win, the temptation or the testimony. We have no one to blame for the temptations that we fall into, whatever they might be. They could be lawful, they could be unlawful. But life is filled with temptations. And we decide where we will be, who will get the victory, who's going to win in that battle. So chapter 39, it begins and ends the same way, with Joseph in bondage. Isn't that something? It begins, he's in bondage. It ends, he's in bondage. Which goes to show you that a person of God, a man of God, a woman of God, they can be so tight with God. And it doesn't mean things will always be easy. And never ever feel condemned or guilty because of your struggles and, and doubt your faith. I think sometimes the struggles are a complement to our faith. You know, God is like, you got so much faith, you can handle this. You can do this. That I can work in you through this thing because you have great faith. So never, never again, doubt God. Joseph, you know, he's in a place, it's all about God working in his life. God changing him. That's the thing. The consistent thing is God is with him. That's the consistent thing. God was with him when his brothers wanted to kill him, when they wanted to throw him in the pit. God was with him when they sold him to the caravan. God was with him when he showed up in Potiphar's house as a slave. God was with him when Potiphar promoted him to the head of the household. 
God was with him in the midst of Potiphar's wife's temptations. God is with him when he's in this jail. God is with him and the jailer promotes him and says, I don't know why this guy's here. This guy's a good guy. I'm going to put him in charge of everything. Sometimes there's no reason why we're in this condition we're in. It's just God. It's just God doing it for us. And in our human thinking, we think, oh, something's wrong. And in God's thinking, it's like, no, man, this is perfect. This is just right. This is all part of the plan. God has a plan for each and every one of us. Joseph understood the value of living for God. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Think about that. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. His enemies. That Joseph, again, these, these Egyptians, right? They're, they're the enemy of Israel. And yet, he's at peace with all these people. They all like him. <laughs> how, how do you get people to like you? Have a good relationship with God. It doesn't mean everybody will like you, but I'll tell you what, if you've got some people that don't like you, let's say you're at work and for some reason people don't like you and they don't even know you. You know that happens? You just look at somebody and it's like, I don't like them. Do you know them? No. I just don't like them. Well, how do you get people to like you when they don't like you? You work on your relationship with God. You reveal God. You emanate God. And, and people see God in you, and that becomes very, very appealing. Very appealing to them. And they say, oh, he's not a bad person after all. It's the best thing we can do. Best thing you can do. You know what work is? Work is like your pulpit. And it's where you go to preach the word of God with your life. Whatever you do. Whatever you do for a living. Doesn't matter what level of importance. It's where you go to preach the gospel with your life. And you, you reveal the Lord Jesus. What did he say? A candle on a hill. Oh, a candle on a hill. A, a city on a hill is not missed by anybody. When a caravan's traveling, they look up, they see a city on a hill at night, they have hope. Oh, we're almost there. Jesus said, we're all like candles. You don't put the candle under a basket. You put it on the shelf so it lights up the whole house. You don't keep your Christianity to yourself. You live it. It doesn't mean you become a pest with it to everybody, but you just live it out. You live it out. You live out the, the attributes of Christ. That's all you do. You live out the virtues of Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, long-suffering, fruit of the Spirit begins to come out. When someone has the fruit of the Spirit, it's very difficult not to love them. It's hard because we love that fruit. People feed on that fruit. We need to develop that fruit. The Holy Spirit, he wants to produce all of that fruit inside of us. So the Christian life will look very appealing to people that are lost. Some people will stay lost and that's the way it is. But there are others, if they could just see a reason to believe, they would believe. And you know where that reason lies? In you and in me, in our lives. That's where the reason is. What they see in us will give them a reason to believe. And that's why temptation is our enemy. It's our enemy. It's not our friend. And the only way to handle temptation, there's only one way, flee. Run! It's the only way. Don't coddle it. Don't like, well, you know, let me see. Let me, let me see how close I can get. I know I'm strong. You're not. I remember a lady one time in our church. She was a great lady. And uh, she was a very protective mother of her children. And I was going to call DCYF on her. Because, I don't know, we gave out candy bars or something one time. And she took the candy bar and broke it in half and said to her son, you can eat half now and the rest you can have later. She put it in her shirt pocket. 
I'm like, are you kidding me? He's going to go around all day smelling that chocolate. It's right there. How can you not eat that when it's in your shirt pocket? It's like, oh man, you're either going to eat it or you're going to throw it away. You can't put it there. No one's strong enough. I'm not. <laughs> to put a half a Hershey in my shirt pocket and don't eat it? I don't know. If you are, God bless you. But no, man. What you got to do is put that thing far away. Out of sight, out of nose, out of everything, and we'll be okay. See, temptation, you can't get close to it. When you see it coming, you go the other way. Whatever it is, and have the authority on your inside dictate to you, tell you what to do. And where does that authority come from? The Word of God. That's where it comes from. God's Word. So, is Joseph disappointed? Perhaps. You know, he was doing good for a while. Back in jail, suffering for something he didn't do. That's not a good feeling when that happens. Most of us have probably been blamed for something we didn't do. And you know that wasn't an enjoyable thing. But we will see that his testimony does not remain a secret. And good things begin to happen again. See, you know what gets Joseph out of all these jams? His testimony. His testimony is the reason he keeps getting promoted. Because of what they see in him. And that's why our testimony is so important. What people see in you. What Christians see in you will either strengthen their faith or weaken their faith. Ooh, how about this one? What non-Christians see in you, especially your non-Christian friends, what they see in you will either bring them close to Christ or just shut the door and say, forget it, man, I don't need that. Our testimony is important. It's important to everybody, Christian and non-Christian alike. So we will see that his testimony doesn't remain a secret and good things begin to happen again. Next time, we're going to see how Joseph overcomes disappointment. And perhaps in our own lives, we'll learn how to overcome disappointment. Let's bow our heads as we pray.